evening everyone welcome to this uh, tutorial session on fundamentals of mind and body i am rubina afrin i am a crime mental research fellow from iit hyderabad so this is our week 2 lectures where i will be discussing through topics and then we will move on to the questions that will help you in assignment 1 and assignment 2 now even if you haven't joined the class uh, this recording will be published on YouTube. Do not worry. So let's start through some basics. I would like to start with some protocol layers. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. So I am uh, good enough, Afrin. Wait a second, I will just uh, share my video. So the first thing that we will start with are the protocol layers. The protocol layers tell that how the packets that are going from transmitter to receiver that are going from source to destination are actually traveling. So let's say that we have some source and we have some destination and the signal is transmitting from source to destination. So in between this path, there will be many more things such as host, router, communication links, Then there would be applications that are running on the end user system. Then there would be the internet protocols and hardware and software on router devices. So all of these are in between the source and the destination. So what we need is that a proper structure should be there. So there is a need for proper structure. What we would like to know is that how the data is going from source to destination. So I would write this on. data goes from source to destination. To explain further, I would like to give a basic example of air traveling. Like suppose you're traveling by airplane, you have to go travel somewhere. So what would you do? 
What would be your steps? The first step that anyone would do follow is the ticket purchase. Then secondly, uh, when we have to go, we will have to go through a baggage checking. The next step would be gates where we will be loaded and then the plane would take off. This whole process would be happening at the source. Now on the destination side, what will happen is the plane is landing. The gates are unloaded. Then you would be claiming the baggage. And lastly, if there is any complaint, then then, then you have to raise by tickets. So from this side to that side, we have this aeroplane routing. That means that the aeroplane actually travels from one place to other. Meanwhile, this would be taken care by air traffic control centers. So what I mean to explain right now is that at every level, at every level we have a pair source to destination we have a pair that is like what whatever we are doing on the source side the replica of that the opposite of that will be done on the destination side so every layer is like uh, doing its own job and the other layer is depending on the previous layer for its work to go on so that is how the communication system also works uh, this uh, every layer is implementing a service. We are dividing the communication system into several layers. And so first, let me write down the layers. There's application layer, transport layer, and there is network layer. data link layer and first physical layer. The OSI, la OSI level have seven layers and the presentation and session layers are sandwiched between the transport and the application layer. So we will be writing this here also. We will be explaining all the layers in brief. So now first we start with application layer. Suppose uh, we have to do this internet browsing. So the browser that is on the client side and the web server that is on the server side, these two layers will, these two application levels are running on the end system. This will constitute the application layer. So you can see that example browser on client side with server on server side. So this is HTTP is these are the examples of application layer. So I'm not going into deep, just a basic introduction of, of uh, what is there in all the layers so that you will be able to solve your questions. Then we have transport layer. This 
the main function of transport player is to control the reliability of communication. There are several functions that the transport layer will be uh, doing, that, uh, such as segmentation, flow control, error control. But the basic idea is that suppose uh, we have a server and we have a receiver. The server can transmit data at the rate of 100 Mbps. The receiver has a limit of 10 Mbps. Now what is happening is suppose that the server is transmitting data to the receiver at the rate of 50 Mbps. That cannot be comprehended by the receiver because its limit is 10 Mbps. It can process signals only at the rate of up to the rate of 10 Mbps. So uh, this transport layer will send the request to the server to decrease the data rate. Or if uh, the data is coming slow, then the transport layer can tell the server to increase data rate. This is one function. The other function is that uh, error control. So if some data is lost, transport layer will send automatic repeat request error. and get the data retransmitted. Transport layer protocols are like TCP, UDP. I'll explain in brief. So TCP basically provides feedback that if the data was delivered or not. And UDP does not provide feedback. So UDP is faster than TCP. So these two protocols are uh, used when uh, whenever the requirement is like that. Like suppose uh, movie streaming is there. Their feedback is not required, so UDP is there. But uh, in case of uh, in case of in case of scenarios where the reliability thing is important, then TCP will be required. So this is the basic function of transport layer. So now we have seen application layer and transport layer. Then we have network layer. So network layer actually routes the data from source to destination. Like we have the data at the source, it will uh, it will determine the path from where the data has to go to the destination. So. The basic function of network layer is routing. So suppose if any packet is coming with a particular destination address, so to route it that from the uh, where the particle has to go, this thing is determined by the network layer. So IP protocol is an example of network layer.
now we have seen network layer now data link layer is there data link layer is responsible for transmission between the data elements like there is a difference between data link layer and network layer network layer will determine the path from source to destination but data link layer is uh, determining the path from uh, one data element to the neighboring data element it is concerned about that whether the data is reaching the next station or not it doesn't know the source it doesn't know the destination but it has to make sure that the data is reaching the next neighboring point so a function of data link layer is trans uh, transmitting between neighboring data elements the data link layer doesn't know source or destination but this data link layer ensures that the data reaches to the next stop so all the information that is it uh, requires is the neighboring element neighboring hop you can say so now we have seen application layer transport layer network layer data link layer now comes physical layer physical layer is basically concerned with the physical medium so in physical layer bits are actually sent through the medium the medium can be wireless or wired medium optical fiber anything so uh, now i will be giving an example of how the data travels from the different layers at the source side and it reaches to the destination side so now suppose Suppose we have this source, and the source layer will contain of application layer, transport layer, network layer, data link layer, and then physical layer. So any message M. that is to be sent so this m is at the application layer when it goes to the transport layer one header will add so this is suppose ht from the transport layer and this m will be encapsulated with that at the network layer one more header will be added so we have m ht and hn at the data link layer one more header will be added for the data link hn H N, H T, and M. So now what is happening is
this is the frame which will be transmitted through the physical layer. The message is generated from here and it will, it will come through the layers and then it will be transmitted to the medium. In the medium we have, suppose we have a switch. And then we have a router. And then again the destination. So the data will travel through the different layers in the switch and the router. The switch will be having physical layer, data link layer, and the data uh, router will also have physical layer, data link layer, and network layer. So it will be traveling through the medium and then reach the destination. At the destination, as I said, opposite process will happen. The data will enter through the physical layer and then it goes to the data link layer. At the uh, like uh, we have seen at the source that each the each of the layer will be adding one header. So at the receiver, opposite process will happen. Each of these layer will be removing the frame, will be removing the header from the frame. So at the link layer, the this would be removed. So what will remain is M, then H T and H L. After link layer, it will go to the network layer. At the network layer, it will be removing the HN header. So what will remain is the message bits and the header that is given by the transport layer. Then the data reaches to transport layer. So at the transport layer, this will be removing this header and the message will remain this message will go to the application layer. So we see as we have described before also that each of these layers are like at the transmitter and at the receiver. Whatever is happening at the transmitter, the reverse will be happening at the receiver. So this is the basic example of a communication, what happens in the communication. Now, uh, I haven't discussed the presentation layer and session layer, but uh, they are basically like, uh, you can say as a part of transport layer. So what happens in the presentation layer is that uh, this uh, uh, data is there. Uh, from the application layer, we have some data that data is translated into bits and describe a bit. So what is happening is data is translated into bits. Then data is compressed. Compression can be lossy or lossless. These are the parts of information that I'm not going into detail. So basically compression is done so that uh, this uh, data transmission can be done faster. Compression will basically require that uh, whatever number of bits uh, the data has, it will reduce the number of bits and then transmit. Then there is encryption. This also happens at the presentation layer. 
so encryption is done for data security compression is done for speed so this is the function of presentation layer next we have a session layer so session layer is basically uh, responsible for the authorization authentication like if the user has uh, if the user is valid or not that is happening at authorization then if the user has access to a certain page or not that is happening so authentication is if user is valid or not authorization is if user has permissions or not then while downloading also we have uh, text data image so uh, this session layer keeps track of which data is image which data is text etc so in general when we have a web web browser this web browser works as application presentation and session layer because all these three are happening on the web browser at the same time so now we will move on to our first question Does that among the below mentioned OSI layers, OSI layers are the seven layers that I have described earlier, including the presentation and the session layers. So we have application layer. Then I uh, must write it here. Application layer. Then presentation layer we have. Then we have session layer. Then we have transport layer. then we have network layer then we have data link layer and finally we have physical layer now uh, i had given an analogy with the airplane travel so what happens is that the process is start from the application layer then it will go to the presentation then session transport network data link layer and finally physical layer the actual transport the actual transmission of data happens at the physical layer and then there will be destination layers here whatever is happening the opposite of that happens at the destination so now we see the question again it is saying among the below mentioned osi layers which one directly interacts with the medium so as we can see from here the layer that directly interacts from the medium is physical layer so here our answer would be physical layer now here you see the next question it is saying the quality of service between end to end devices is maintained by so quality of service is performance indicator as we have discussed above uh, in transport layer what do we do is it will control the reliability of transmission
so transport layer is taking care of segmentation flow control and error control so segmentation means that it divides the data into chunks so that it will be transmitted fastly and then at the receiver side it will combine the data then flow control is that it tells the server to slow data rate or increase data rate then error controls means that if any packet is not received then it will be sending the automatic repeat request and then uh, based upon the uh, what our desire is uh, the transport layer will have tcp or udp forms of transmission so from here we can see that the quality of service between the end devices will be maintained by the transport layer now before going to the diversity i would like to discuss something about path loss so what happens is that suppose uh we have these propagation models Suppose we have a transmitter and we have a receiver. Here we are considering that there is no uh, interference present, no other element present. We are considering a line of sight scenario, and the distance between the transmitter and receiver is d. So. and the power received at the signal uh, at the receiver is pr so this would be included in the large scale propagation model this large scale prediction model depicts the received power at a distance d here we are assuming that d is large enough like suppose d is of the order of 100 emitted then how much data is fluctuated from the transmitter to the receiver that is modeled by pr then we have the other model as a small scale propagation model this model will be giving the uh, received power but uh, the distance would be very short like it will give fluctuations of signal over very short distance that is in the order of wavelength or maybe if we want to see fluctuation over a period of time then also it will be over short duration then 
that means few seconds. So what actually happens is that uh, whenever we have a transmitter, and we have some receiver at a particular distance d, so power dissipation will happen. Like this it happens, the power, the as the distance will increase, the power will be more like it will be decreased with distance. We will see, see the order of how much it will be decreasing over this uh, period of class. And then one more important thing is that when power is below threshold, then we can say that outage happens. That is no coverage. So suppose that this is our axis for received thing, received power. And this is the D axis. So two things are happening. One thing is that uh, there are local fluctuations. And then the other thing is that there is an average fluctuation that is dependent upon the distance. So these we can call as instantaneous fluctuation. And these are the average fluctuations. If you go into more detail, uh, suppose we want to cover uh, everything like uh, path loss, shadowing, and then fading, if we want to cover, then suppose this is the transmitter receiver separation distance D. And again, this is the received power. So empirically, this has been shown that the path loss fluctuates like this. Very steady fluctuation from the transmitter to the receiver. Then we have shadowing. Shadowing is like fluctuations over the average path loss at a particular area. And then we have these local fluctuations that are modeled as fading. So what we mean to say is that this is the path loss. Then this is the fading. Uh, this is the shadowing. And then this one is the small scale fading. Now we again come to the free space propagation.
So suppose we, we only have line of sight components. We have a transmitter. And we have the receiver. Both of them at distance D. The received signal, the received power at a receiver is given by PRD. The received power at the receiver is given by the free, free space propagation loss. which is given by so this is the formula for free space propagation loss that is the first formula so the received power at a distance d from the transmitter that is given by that is dependent upon the antenna gains at the transmitter and the receiver. Uh, antenna gains at the transmitter, antenna gains at the receiver. Then wavelength, then obviously distance, and L. L is the coupling loss, filter loss, etc. That means all the other losses. So usually, this L is taken as Y. Now we can say that when free space is there, there is only line of sight between the transmitter and the receiver. This is the line of sight. There is no other interference, no other reflection, nothing is happening. So here we can say that this received power is inversely proportional to D square, which means that 20 dB per dKd. These uh, antenna gains are given as GT and GR. Any antenna gain G is given as 4 pi A by lambda square. Here A is the antenna aperture. So the main takeaway from here is that when there is no reflected components, anything, there is only line of sight. Then the power is decaying as 1 upon d square. So this is in the line of sight case. It's very important to note that this is for the line of sight case as we will be seeing for the other cases as well. So if we write now 10 log of PT by PR, this would be minus 10 log of GT, GR, lambda square by 4 pi square, D square. Now we have considered the L as one, the other coupling losses or a, any other loss. L is. Delta loss, etc. This is given by path loss in dB. I request you all to work it out. This is negative because we have taken PT upon PR. So this is minus 10 log of these terms. Now if we were to simplify more, we can assume antenna gain says 1. Then what would be the path loss in dB? Minus 10 log of 
lambda square upon super square d square. Now we see that this uh, path loss is uh, dependent upon this d. In linear scale, we can write. We can be saying this. So we have this transmitter and a receiver with a distance d. Now, if I say d equal to zero, then this power will go infinite. Or if I say d is uh, so, this this. Uh, it's like D cannot be zero. So there must be a threshold distance from where we can compare the power, right? So now we assume that there is some distance D naught that we are taking as a reference. So if this is known, We assume that power of d naught as it is proportional to one upon d naught square, then it will be known. So now we have to obtain receive power at any distance d. That we can do by simple scaling, right? Like we can take this reference power and then multiply d naught square by d square. Now this d naught is minimum distance, so this d will always be greater than d naught. What about p r d naught? How this is known? So p r d naught is calculated empirically. So everywhere in the numericals related to the path loss, we will be given any received power at a reference distance d dot. So from there we can calculate the received power at any distance d. Now there is an important concept of Then of a distance. This friend of a distance is defined as two times d square by lambda. Where d is the largest linear dimension of the antenna. Lambda is the wavelength of radio wave. So one important criteria is that D naught is always greater than this span of a distance. And also D naught should be much smaller than that average base station to mobile station distance. So when we write power at any distance d equals to power at a dif reference distance d naught into d naught upon d whole square. What we assume is that d is greater than d naught and this d naught is greater than the front upper distance. So converting in, into db form, what we can say is that received power in db equals to power at the reference distance in db is 20 log of d naught upon d.
and since this d is greater than d you know, this term would basically be negative which will be leading to dk 20 db per dk dk so the dk would be 20 db per dk this is an important concept so i will highlight this also So this we have calculated when we have only line of sight component. Now, what if we have reflected components as well? Because transmission doesn't happen in line of sight. There, is, there will always be somewhere that the signal is reflected from. So the simplest model for uh, modeling the reflection thing is the 2D model. So the two D model. Let's see that suppose. We have a transmitter. This is the ground. And then we have a receiver. So this is the transmitter and this is the receiver. The transmitter has a height of HT and the receiver has a height of HR. So always there will be given line of sight component that is going from the transmitter to receiver directly. In the 2D model, we assume that one component will reach after reflection from the ground. So this is the line of sight path. And this is the reflected one. So uh, this is the 2D model. I should mention it here. The main thing that we assume in 2D model is that our D is the separation distance between the transmitter and the receiver that is much greater than the height of transmitter or the height of receiver. Now the formula for received power is P R equals to P T into G T G R H T square H R square divided by D to the power four. So the two ray model takes into account the antenna heights as well, H T and H R. So the received power is dependent upon the antenna heights as well. So now the important thing that we see is that for LOS, the received power was dependent upon one upon D square. We just added one more uh, reflected signal. In addition to the LOS signal, we just added one more. Now you can say that this received power is now proportional to 1 upon d to the power 4. So this happened just when we increased one reflection. In the general scenario, in real life scenario, this is not the case. In real life scenario, uh, many more reflections would be there. This can come from somewhere else then there would be some other sort of reflection. So I'm giving the general idea that th there can be some trees or some reflectors are there, buildings are there, anything can happen. This is the real life scenario. So now we will see the coefficient, the d to the power coefficient. I will be writing this formula again. Now we convert it into decibel, path loss, we write. Path loss in dB would be 10 log of PT upon PR. So this term would come as positive. So we have this 
40 log of d minus 10 log of g2 plus 10 log of gr plus 20 log of ht because ht is in a square power then 20 log of hr here we can see this is 40 log d in the eloise model this is 20 log d so one reflection coefficient one reflection component we added and it went 40 log d so in real environment we can see that This is actually 10 into NP. Is the coefficient where NP is path loss exponent. So these and all have been done from the measurements, and it has been found that NP would lie from 1.4 to 6. So on the measurements are given, if you consult any book, then uh, you will find out that the path loss exponent is different for the different scenarios. Like for the indoor scenarios, I think it is usually less than 2. And uh, in the outdoor scenarios, it will increase so the main gist is like this now we will again see some questions this question is about diversity so what is the function of diversity So what happens is that uh, suppose we have a transmitter and we have a receiver and the data is getting transmitted in single link. So there is a chance that the link can be broken. There is a chance that uh, uh, some error can happen. So the solution for this is that uh, suppose we uh, increase it to multiple channels like suppose we are transmitting same information from different paths. So what is happening at the receiver is that suppose uh, one path is in error. Even then the uh, other paths will take it to the correct uh, signal. So this is done in diversity so basically what we are doing is that we are repeating the signals so uh, this will be increasing the average snr diversity is said to combat shadowing effect not large scale bidding So the diversity combining helps in increasing average SNR. Now, let me move on to the next question. So it is saying in, the gen in general the wireless channels are. So what happens here is that uh, okay, uh, I will start with the baseband channel, baseband signal. So at the transmitter, uh, we will be explaining it here.
what we have at the transmitter is here part of is still ready it to the five a two pi c t with this is the complex envelope So this is at the transmitter. Now, at the receiver, suppose uh, we are considering this noiseless received signal. So at the receiver, we will have RT. So whenever a signal is transmitted through some channel, it will give some delay and some phase difference. So delay we write it as is of t minus tau n, and then there would be some phase difference that we can model with e to the power j two pi. Suppose the transmitter or receiver anything is moving, so there is a relative Doppler shift. So that we can model in the FC. And then this will go through a time lag of tau n. Then there would be some amplitude scaling. This will happen through all the n parts. So at the receiver, the n parts would be combining. So we will take it as summation of n equal to one to n. Suppose this is transmitted and this is receiver. So there are multiple paths from the transmitter to the receiver. Now, as we discussed in the previous lecture, that we can always take baseband signal. This frequency component is not needed. Because whatever is happening at the transmitter, the receive the opposite will be happening at the receiver. So the effect of frequency can be uh, removed at the receiver. So here we will try to find the baseband component of it. So now suppose just suppose that uh, uh, we take the phase difference phi in s two pi. DNT minus FC plus FD into tau t. So this is the phase difference incurred from the nth path. Now what we can write it as now the received signal will be summation n equals to one to n c n e to the power this is capital N. We are assuming that there are n parts. So e to the power j phi n t that is the phase difference happening from the nth path. Then we have s t minus tau n. This is delay from the nth path. And then we have separated the FC part. Now we can write it as real part of R delta D e to the power J2 by FCT. Now you see, this is the transmitted signal. This is the received signal. So always what we do is that we find the relation between the transmitter and the received signal, right? So we can write it as R delta T equals to summation n equal to 1 by n, 1 to n. C n e to the power j phi n t is still in t minus tau n. There could be some noise added. So, uh, considering that we are 
uh, taking a noiseless channel right now. This is the noiseless received signal. Further, we will add noise, but that is not our concern right now. So that is why we have considered noiseless received signal. Now you can see that we always have the, uh, there is some transmitted signal that is going through a channel. So we can write it as y equals to aj if no noise is there. So can we write it as okay, the function of t and tau n equals to c n e to the power j phi and t. This means that the channel for each path would be a product of this amplitude scaling and some phase scaling. So now the received signal can be written as summation n equals to 1 to n that is the all parts. Then we can say h and t that is the a channel for the nth path and which is obviously time variant then s of t minus tau n now usually we consider the narrow band channel so all these uh, delays that we are seeing that the transmitter to receiver suppose this is transmitter and this is receiver different paths are having different delays. Now we are saying that all these delays are equal. We can model them as so we say that the signal incurs same delay on each channel and the uh, signal is uh, transmitted signal is multiplied by the channel coefficient of that channel. So we can write received signal as like that till nth channel. But now we are saying that these uh, delays are almost same. So now we can model it as summation i equals to 1 to n. n equals to 1 to n we will take h and t delta. HMT is of T minus tau. So the equivalent channel now you tell. Can we say that this is the equivalent channel? So now uh, at the received signal, at the receiver, we can say that this is suppose the transmitted signal it is delayed by some specific delay tau and then it is multiplied by h1 t and added to another signal that is multiplied by h2 t the same signal and then added Similarly, then ends. This is the example of a classic FIR filter structure. That is linear time invariant. 
but here we see that these components are time varying all these channel components are time varying so now this won't be lti this will be linear time varying i hope that is clear now we will move again to the question so it is saying in general the wireless channel r what should be the answer answer would be b linear time varying then it is saying among the listed type of fading which is considered to be small scale fading so we know that path loss is large scale shadowing is also not small scale fading but this really fading in recent fading these are considered to be small scale fading the major explanation of this topic is given in the wrap up board and maybe you can refer to the lecture videos for the same now this is saying at the transmitter the baseband signal is up converted to our frequency of uh, this frequency is given and at the receiver uh, the local oscillator is used for down conversion and this has a frequency which is uh, little bit different like it has some error and the phase difference is also given as pi by 6 radian so for this question we will consider the uh, this uh, communication scenario so what happens is that at the transmitter we have the symbols which are uh, some suppose mpsk or qm symbols anything like that then these are up converted sent to the channel at the receiver these guys are down converted and then here signal processing happens so in this question we are considering this part so at the transmitter during up conversion concern with this part so at the transmitter during up conversion what happens is that uh, suppose some xt is there so this is up converted into u to the power j2 by ct plus some phase at the receiver we assume that the down converter has the exact knowledge of this fcm phi so as to down convert it to ideally but practically that doesn't happen right so practically there will always be some error in the carrier frequency information or the phase information so there is some difference that is given that uh, it is given that phase difference between oscillator at transmitter and receiver is Five and six radian, right? And then there is some difference between the frequency as well. So at the receiver, what happens is that this is the transmitted signal. at the receiver we 
we have the down converted signal as RT into e to the power j 2 pi fct plus phi. Now, uh, here we are saying that there is some error between the frequency at transmitter and receiver and the phase at transmitter and receiver oscillators. So we will do some nomenclatures. Here, FCT we are saying, and here FCR we are saying, here this is phi t, here this is phi r. And what is RT? R is XT plus NT, right? So now you just uh, multiply this RT term with e to the power j2 pi FCT plus phi. So what will happen is e to the power minus j by fc r t plus phi r into xt e to the power j 2 pi fc t plus phi t and then some equivalent noise will be there write it as n delta so this will give us xt into e to the power j 2 pi fc transmitter minus fc receiver into t plus phi t minus phi r this when you calculate and then plus nt so what is fc minus fr i might write it here fc fc t minus fcr so it'll be equal to 10 to the power minus 7 gigahertz so that is 10 to the power 9 hertz so this is approximately 100 hertz and the phase difference between transmitter and receiver is given as 5 by 6 radian So here we can write it as xt into e to the power j 2 pi and xc minus fr is 100. So this is 200 pi t and minus pi by 6 plus nt. So here you see that it is given that the down converted signal can be written as xt into zt plus nt. So here, what is Z t e to the power 200 pi t minus pi by 6? So this d would be answer. Now we have a cellular communication system that is operating at the carrier frequency of 6 gigahertz. So we have our carrier frequency is 6 gigahertz. Now it is asking ki, what would be the range of distance over which average received signal power should be computed to model the large scale fading. This concept is given in Rappaport and it is, uh, you can refer to lecture 5 for the detailed explanation. But here what we'll be do is that we have the carrier frequency, we will compute the wavelength. So wavelength would be C upon FC that is that is 0 0.05 meter so for large scale fading d should be in the range of 5 lambda to 40 lambda so from here it should be 0 0.25 meter to 2 meter so the answer is D. The next question is very simple. Mono system is consisting of. So we know that we have SISO system that is 
single transmitter and single receiver. For SISO, we have one transmitter and one receiver. Then we have SIMO that is single at transmitter and multiple at receiver. This node two, this should be multiple. Then we have MISO system that has multiple transmitters, antennas, and single receiver antennas. Then we have MIMO system that has multiple transmitting antennas and multiple receiver antennas. So here the answer would be multiple antennas at both transmitting and receiving side. Uh, this question is very nice. Uh, this uh, in this question, the symbol duration is 10 millisecond, and the pulse is given at the input of integrate and dump circuit. So basically, that's what the thing is happening. Here it is saying that uh, there is an error in time synchronization. Normally, we assume that uh, there is a perfect synchronization for the match filtering to happen because uh, otherwise it will give false results that we will see now. So if the integration starts at one millisecond instead of origin, so usually what we have is that suppose this is the pulse that is given. So the duration for the matched filter is also the same as the duration of the pulse. So it will integrate and dump and then integrate and then dump. Like that it happens. So uh, if the if there is no time, if there is perfect time synchronization, then there would be no error. But in this case, if it is starting at one, so it will go till 11. If there is a phase difference between the adjacent symbols, then it will give incorrect result because here instead of decoding one, it would be decoding as zero. Then it will go like this. So every time there would be a delay of one millisecond. So if the uh, symbols, adjacent symbols are in phase, then there would be no error, but they are, if they are out of phase, then there will be error. And this type of error is called inter-symbol interference. We can move on to the next question. The interface channel between point A and B in the communication system. So this I have discussed in the previous class also. What happens here at A and B is that I'll describe it again. So here what is happening is that there are RF, this is RF amplifier at the transmitter, RF amplifier at the receiver. So this is including carrier frequency in it. So what kind of channel would this be? This would be RF channel. But if we consider this interface, then we don't need to consider this carrier frequency. We don't need to uh, take this carrier frequency into account. For this interface, there is one analog baseband channel incoming, and then there is an analog baseband channel signal coming back from the channel. So this is one baseband analog channel. So the naming of channel varies with what we require. We don't require FC here. So in spite of the thing that this RF amplifier is there, we don't consider because at the receiver, the reverse process is happening. So now here we see at this interface, there is symbols that are coming. Suppose QPSK symbols are there. These are going to the channel. And here also noise added symbols are there, but they are symbols only, discrete symbols only. So the noise added symbols can be like some here, 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 here like that. But these will be discrete symbol only. So what would be the interface channel between point A and B? This will be. discrete time 
channel. You can refer to the previous tutorial where I have discussed this topic in detail. And then you can see that the, the nomenclature of channel depends on the requirements that we have. So for this question, the answer would be discrete time channel. Now here the power of a certain transmitter signal is 10 milliwatt. So PT we have been given is 10 milliwatt. The signal power in dB is given by 10 log to the power 10 of PT. But if uh, we have to find in dBm, then it will be 10 to the power divided by 10 to the power minus 3. Now in this case, we have the signal part as 10 milliwatt. So which is equal to 10 dBm. This would be the answer. Moving on to the next question, path loss exponent for the indoor line of sight communication. So before, as we were discussing, that the path loss can be written as 10 to NP log of D minus 10 log GT plus 10 log GR plus 20 log HT plus 20 log Actually, if any other power, power loss is also there, then it can be included here. So in real environment, this happens. NP is the path loss exponent. NP lies between 1.4 to 6. And the minimum is in the indoor. So for indoor line of sight communication, the path loss exponent is less than 2. Now we have this question. Here the received power at distance of 30 meter is given as minus 20 dBm. So as I was telling earlier, that we will always have a D naught received power at a distance, reference distance D naught given. So this is given as minus 20 dBm and we have D naught as 30 meter. So we convert it into linear scale. This minus 20 dBm is always while converting from dBm to dB. What you have to do is just uh, subtract 30. So here this would be equal to minus 50 dB. And now we are uh, we have been asking the received power at 100 meter. So we have D as 100 meter. And this is saying free space propagation. So free space we have seen earlier only that the path loss exponent is 2. So now we can write we are at distance D, we are at D naught, D naught upon D to the power of N. That is 10 to the power. This would be equal to 10 to the power minus 5 watt, 10 to the power 5, 10 to the power minus 5, 30 upon 100, that's that. We will convert it into dBm. So this will come as minus 30.45. I do request all of you to try it once because this is a very simple question. So the answer is minus 30.45 dBm. Now the channel distribution, the distribution followed by received power. See linear scale for shadow fading. Shadow fading uses log normal distribution. Now this is saying match the channel path loss models with a given NP. So as we discussed earlier, this term is always 10 times NP into log of D. So we will just focus on these terms. 
here in first case a1 10 in p is 25 which implies path loss exponent will be 2.5 so for a1 it would be b3 for a2 we see 10 in p is 35 so in p is 3.5 that is b2, a1 is b3, a2 is b2. For a3 we see in 10 and p is 48. So in p would be 4.8. 4.8 is b4, a3 is matched as b4. Then for e4 we have 10 and p equals to 65. So in p. 6.5 that is b5 so the correct option is option c now this is we have to find the doppler shift when the mobile user is moving away from the base station so this is one important point that it is saying that this is moving away from the base station so when mobile user is moving away from the station, Doppler shift is negative. So these two are not there. Now we have two options to choose from. So If the velocity is 90 km per hour, we convert it into meter per second, it is 90. Which is 25 meter per second. So we know the Doppler shift is v cos theta by lambda and then we can write lambda as fc by c sorry c by fc so this is now we put all the values v is 25 cos theta is root 3 by 2 cos theta is 30 degree then fc is 2 gigahertz and C is 3 into 10 to the power 8. So calculating it, it will give 144 hertz. But since mobile station is moving away, so Doppler shift would be minus 144 hertz. The answer would be D. Moving on to the next question. It is asking local average fluctuation of uh, uh, received signal power with transmitted receiver separation distance is observed data. So local average fluctuation it is saying. So we have described the received power versus distance graph that I will show again. This is the case. This is the path loss, but then local average fluctuation. You can see in this pink diagram, pink graph. So this is fluctuating across some average path loss. So the local average fluctuation is given by shadowing. Can be shadowing. Then 
then here the transmit antenna part is 0 dB and D received power at a distance D is minus 90 dB and we have to find the corresponding power loss in dB. So power loss we know as in dB it is 10 to the base 10 of Pt upon Pr. So this is 10 log of Pt minus 10 log of Pr. So we can say that path loss is transmit power in dB minus receive power in dB. Now you see, transmit power is given as 0 dBm. So to convert it into dB, we do add it by 30. So this is 30 dB. And then received power at a distance D is given as minus 90 dB. So we again add 30 dB to it, which is minus. Sixty dB. So now we have to find path loss. That is thirty minus minus sixty dB. That is ninety dB. So B is the answer for this. Now we have this question for region fading channel. So in the region fading channel, what happens is that uh, Condition fading, one path is always dominant. When we considered relay fading, there was fading in the channel, but there was no, not any LOS path. But in recent fading, one path will have the large path. So the power profile for Addition fading channel is given as oh, let, let's start with power profile is given as P alpha equals to x upon B naught exponential minus x square plus s square upon 2 B naught. This is a basal function of first order. And then this in key factor is S square upon 2 B naught. So when K is infinity, then there would be no fading. So that is almost line of sight channel. If k is equals to zero, then we can put s as zero because k is zero, s is zero. So this will give the power profile of Rayleigh fading. So if k is equals to zero, this region fading channel is Rayleigh fading only. And when k is greater than zero, then there would be no line of sight components as well as one path that is dominant. So here we have A1 is no line of sight channel that is matched as B2. A2 for daily fading is matched for 
B1. D3 almost no fading is for k equal to infinity. So in this case, the answer is B. So to conclude, what we had today was I'll again rehydrate we started with the introduction of osi layers where we know that from source to destination we have to travel and there will be some components in between the source and destination so what we need is a proper structure to go from the source to destination so for that the different osi layers are there so the main five protocol layers is application layer, transport layer, network layer, then data link layer is there, and then physical layer. This physical layer is responsible for physical transmission. Then there are presentation and session layers also in the seven layer OSI model that we have also seen. So the application layer is on the application side, that is the browser side. So it uses the HTTP, HTTPS like that. And then we have transport layer, which is uh, uh, responsible for the reliability of communication that we can say that quality of service is handled by the transport layer. So transport layer will be doing this. Uh, it will see the server to decrease data rate and increase data rate. Then there will be error checking TCP and UDP are the different transmission protocol that are with feedback and without feedback. With feedback, we have TCP, which is slow but reliable. So it is used in the reliable connections. UDP is faster because it has no feedback and it is used for movie streaming, etc. So this is faster, but there would be more buffering, more errors there. Then there is network layer and data link layer. So network layer is for determining the path from the source to the destination and data layer would be transmitting between the neighboring data element. It will ensure that the data has reached to the nearest neighboring hop. So this is the difference between network layer and data, data link layer. So network layer is uh, in IP protocol. And then the data uh, comes to physical layer from where it is actually transmitted from the either wireless or wired layers, like optical fiber is there or any other medium is there. So each layer, each OSI layer will add its own header to the message signal. And on the, trans on the receiver side, the reverse of it happens. Then we saw the presentation layer and session layer. The presentation layer is responsible for the compression and encryption. That is increasing the speed of the uh, transmission as well as the data security that uh, we do on encryption. Then we have session layer that will do the authentication and then authorization. Authentication is whether the user would be valid or not. And authorization is if the user has performance or not permissions or not then we have seen the propagation model the propagation layer model is one is large scale propagation model and the other is small scale propagation model so other uh, small scale propagation model uh, some small scale fading happens that is that we will see in small scale propagation later later maybe we will discuss in the large scale propagation model the receiver power at distance D is depicted. So then we saw the path loss, path loss shadowing and small scale shadowing, small scale fading. So path loss is like gradual decrease of received signal power with the distance. And path loss is seen when there is only line of sight channel. And then we have shadowing. Shadowing is like uh, 
towards a towards a in shading with will the received power will fluctuate towards the mean of a, a particular path loss so this is steady but it will vary across a given area then we have a small scale fading which is uh, like uh, which will happen very uh, instantaneous fluctuations so that is modeled by the small scale fading then we saw the free space free space propagation and free uh, free space propagation loss so we have a transmitter and a receiver and we have uh, these at a distance d the transmitter to receiver separation is at a distance d so uh, from the free free space propagation loss we saw that the received power at a distance d is proportional to 1 upon d square that is it will decrease 20 db per decade with the decrease of d then uh, we saw the path loss path loss is the 10 log of pt upon pr that is given by uh, this equation here next we moved on to simplified path loss where we simplified the antenna gain we have taken as 1 and then we see that the path loss is uh, uh, proportional to 1 upon d square but there is there should be some lower limit of d because d d as 0 is not feasible so now we see that uh, there is some minimum distance d we can call it as minimum distance then if we know the power received at the at the distance d not then by simple scaling we can find the power at any distance d and this is calculated empirically so we need not to worry about it this will always be given in the questions then we saw the limit on d d not should be always greater than the front of a distance that is 2d square upon lambda d is the largest dimension of antenna and lambda is the wavelength of radio wave so based upon these two assumptions we have defined the uh, received power at a distance d and then we see that uh, for the reflection uh, we have considered the simplest model as turi model this is the simplest model so here we have assumed that the Uh, separation between the transmitter and the receiver d should be very large than the antenna height that is transmitter antenna or receiver antenna so for this case for this turi model scenario we have seen that the received power now varies as 1 upon d to the power phi 1 upon d to the power 4 so for line of sight communication the received power was varying as 1 upon d square we added one reflection component and it is now varying as 1 upon d to the power 4 but in practical scenarios there will be more reflection signals there will be more signals that come from the reflection so how do we model path loss in that case so for this case path loss we have we have this formula that we have seen before also so now we have the 40 log d term here which in general is 10 into np where np is the path loss exponent and this np varies from 1.4 to 6 this is all calculated empirically so you don't need to worry about the proof and all then we saw the channel modeling for the bandpass signal so we have seen the uh, transmitted signal is given in the form of this a real part of uh, this is the complex in velar and then e to the power j2 by fct this is the baseband signal so uh, when the signal is transmitted it will incur some uh, some time lag would be there which is modeled as t minus tau n and then some doppler would be there so that is modeled as fc plus fd all of this 
uh, the frequency change, all of this we have modeled as phi n. So phi n is the phase difference for nth path. So we are the transmitter and we have the receiver and we have multiple paths from the transmitter to the receiver. Suppose this contains, uh, this is for tau 1 time lag, this is tau 2 time lag, this is tau 1 time lag. So like this it happens. So from here we can see that uh, we have modeled all of this into phase phi n. And then we have simplified our equation like this. And then we have taken all of this as RT. So from here we get the received signal as a product of some coefficient into the transmitted signal. So from there we get the channel model. Then for the received signal, now we can say the received signal is the sum of transmitted signal into the channel coefficient at the different paths. So from here we model the uh, received signal as the sum of the different channels multiplied by the uh, transmitted signal. This can be further simplified into an FIR filter structure, but here the filter coefficients are time varying. These HIs are time varying. So uh, in our FIR filter structure, the, the coefficient for linear time invariant but here they will be linear time and variant. So that is why the channels, channels are linear time variant. Then we moved on to the discussion of different questions that are based upon the topics that we discussed. So I hope this much is clear. In case of any doubt, you may uh, post any you may post at the discussion forum or maybe mail me so we can see about that and the recording will be uploaded on youtube as well as on the uh, portal so maybe you can go through it later so that's it from my side thank you so much okay then good night